Psalms 86. I haven't felt real well since yesterday evening. I had a bad headache last night and had trouble going to sleep. My head was bothering me. Got up this morning, had to take some ibuprofen, and uh, uh, just hadn't felt really good. But we're here, and praise God, you're there, and I'm here, and we'll see what the Lord does. This is one of my ten favorite psalms. Uh, when you're a preacher, you're asked all the time, what is your favorite verse? What is your favorite psalm? Um, just out of curiosity, I like to do things different sometimes. What is your favorite psalm? Brother Eddie, Psalm 103. Anybody else? What is your favorite psalm? Brother Jim, Psalm 37. Boy, y'all named two great ones. Named two of my top ten already. Who else? Brother John Hurd, 23, yes, sir. Can you raise your hand, Brother Tony, after everybody else? Say, what? 118. Okay. Brett. What? Psalm 1. That's a good psalm. 91 is a good Who said 91? 91 is a great one. And for what we're going through, I've seen yard signs in, in, in yard people. Have you seen them? Psalms 91. I see them all over the place. Uh, that, that's my friend Johnny McDowell in uh, Morning Robin. That's his favorite psalm. He loves it. Anybody else have a favorite psalm? Anybody else? Brother David. 89. Psalm 89. Anyone else? Miss, Miss Lee, Miss Mary. 48, Psalm 48. Good to see you back in church, you and Brother Lee. Uh, we, we ain't the same without y'all around here. Brother Greg? Psalm 32. Boy, that's a good I, I'm surprised somebody had hit that one yet. Yeah, Psalm 32. Yeah. Anyone else? Let's do something else real quick. What is your favorite verse in the Bible? Your favorite verse in the Bible? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. What else? Brett. Huh? John 3, 16. That's a good one, son. Can't go wrong with John 3, 16. Who else? Just a verse that means something special to you, Brother Tony. Romans 8, 38 and 39. Brother Eddie, 6, 10. I could almost have picked that when he raised his hand. Psalm 46, 10. The reason I said that is there's a story behind that. And uh, I knew when he raised his hand, he'd probably say 46, 10. Be still and know that I am God. Yeah, that's great. Miss Helen, what's she say? Joshua 1, 9. That's a good one. Yes, ma'am. Who else? Miss Juana. 410. 411. Yes, that's what I almost preached Wednesday night. I studied Philippians 4, 10, 11, but I couldn't get out of verse 8 Wednesday night. But that is a good, whatever state I am, therewith to be content. Yes, ma'am. If we could live that, we would all be very well off compared to what we are. Somebody say amen. I mean... You know, emergencies happen, tragedies happen, accidents happen, um, hurting, painful things happen. But if you can learn to be content where you are with whatever God gives you and wherever God puts you, then you're going to be okay. I guarantee you. I'm really excited about this crowd this morning. This, this is Good crowd. I think I'll just preach a few minutes. Amen. Psalms 80. Anybody got a verse? For, I don't want to cut anybody off. Anybody got a verse that burning on your heart? Anybody? Brother John. Brother Jim. Romans 6, 23. Yes, see. For the wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Is that right? Amen. Wonderful verse. 
I think my favorite verse in the Bible, mine's changed through the years. Mine used to be um, uh, Galatians 2.20. Then it was Matthew 6.33. Then it was Joshua 1.8. I think I've gone back to Matthew 6.33, Brother John. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If we put God first in our lives, we put God first in our lives, I believe everything else will fall in place. How many of y'all believe that? Amen? Psalms 86. This is a prayer of David. This is also written. I like to do a study on Psalms lately. I found, um, I, I was on Google a while back, and I found this Bible study tool that does a study of all the Psalms and a little history around them. Psalms 86 was written in the latter part of David's life. It was written when he had already been through, uh, I would say it not all, but most of the tragic, hurtful things, and even most of the victories in life. So he was an older man in the latter part of his life when he wrote Psalms 86. He says, Bow down thine ear, O Lord, hear me. For I am poor and needy. If I didn't read another verse, we just read enough. I'm going to tell you where there's no room for in God's kingdom, and that's self-arrogance. That's condescending attitude. That's, I'm better than you, or you're such a sinner, or I'm really a pretty good guy. No, none of us are pretty good guys. The Bible says, matter of fact, in Isaiah, that the best that we have to offer to God are as filthy rags. So if you ever are going to go very far with God, you're going to come to him like David did here. You're going to say, Lord, bow your ear to hear me, for I am poor and needy. I told Eddie this and some others. I've read a lot of your older books from your older writers. One of, the, one of the letters, the books I wrote, was by a man named Samuel Rutherford. He was 16, 1700s back in there. Samuel Rutherford was called one of the greatest preachers ever lived. And what he did was he wrote letters. And they recorded his letters he wrote to people. It was letters he wrote to people. Now here's a neat thing, and I got a goosebump thinking about it. The other day my phone rang. I said, hello. And it was Dr. Ray Young. Dr. Ray Young was Dr. Jack Howell's associate pastor and bus director for 40 years. Dr. Ray Young knows more about buses than anybody in America, I can tell you. But the most humble guy you'll ever be around. There's no arrogance. There's none. But I, I said, hello. And he said, Brother Ed Strickland. I said, yes, sir. I know who it was. I didn't see the caller ID. He said, Dr. Ray Young here. He said, Ray Young here. I said, hey, preacher, how you doing? We talked a few minutes. He said, I don't know if you know about this or not, Brother Ed, but he said, right before Brother Howells died, about a year before he died, I had been talking to him for 10 years about him letting me do something, and Brother Howells kept saying, no. No, Ray, that ain't no. No, Ray, I don't know. No, Ray. And he said, finally, a year before he died, he said, Ray, why are you wanting to do this? He said, I don't want everybody to know what I've done for people privately or things I've done. He said, Preacher, you know I would never do that. But he said, I, wanna, I would like people to see your correspondence letters with you and great men of God. And what he did was he took his letters, and there was 5,500 letters Brother Howells wrote. Brother Howells was like just... I mean, he wrote, his secretary said, he wrote letters every day of his life. 
and he was sending to people. So Brother Ray Young has put together three books. He's took the letters and he's, he's picked out the ones that he felt like would help preachers and help people and he's put it in a book form. And last night, when I got home, I ordered them like a week ago, and they were sitting on my kitchen counter. It was late, 11, 1130, and I said, you know, I just picked the first volume up, and I began to read it. And I won't go through all the stuff. I'll tell you, you'll hear more about them in the future, I'm sure. But the first one got me, Brother Keith. The first one was the first letter he wrote as a young pastor in 1948. And I meant to bring it with me and just want to read exactly what he said. But here's what he said, Brother Tony. He was writing this letter to his mother and to his sister. And he said, hello, mother, sister, this is Jack. He said, I had my first day today as a pastor of the so-and-so Baptist church in Marshall, Texas. He said, they're really poor people. They're really hard. He said, Half of them wore overalls and white shirts and brought family Bibles with them. He said there was Model A's and Model T's in the parking lot. And he goes on to talk about how poor they were and this or that. He said, but Mother, I've never felt the love I felt today from a group of 25 people like I did today. And he said, I was so humble that God would let me pastor anywhere. And he went on to talk about how he was so nervous and scared. And how he said, Mother, I preach today and I don't think I preach well. He said, I really think the people deserve better. And he goes on in the letter. And I brought that up to you because... Bow thine ear to me, because I'm poor and needy. The day that we think we're something is the day we're in trouble. The day that we don't see ourselves as a sinner in need of a holy God is the day we're in trouble. Humility is not cowardice. Humility is realizing who God is, who you are, what you don't deserve, but what God gives you. Somebody say amen. He said, bow thine ear, O Lord, hear me, for I am poor and needy. Now, I didn't mean to preach on that, but I just did anyway. Preserve my soul, for I am holy. He said, wait a minute now, preacher. If he's holy, because what God has put in him and what God has done through him. O oh God, my God, save thy servant that trusteth in thee. Be merciful unto me, O oh Lord, for I cry unto thee daily. Church, church, listen to what America needs. America needs Christians on their knees. Do you hear me? America needs a touch of God. America needs a powerful touch of God. America needs a life-changing touch of God. And that's going to come when America gets on her knees, when she prays. John Wesley said, I will never face another human being until I have spent three hours in prayer to God. George Whitfield said, if I had a choice of anything I could do for half of a day, it would be to pray. Brother Ron, we've lost that gift. We don't come meet at the church and pray like they used to. You say, well, old-fashioned church, old-fashioned church, and, and I'm not taking no pot shot, but it's not some high-octane service. You know what old-fashioned church is? Huh? Old-fashioned church, when the people of God come to the house of God, and they get on their faces before God. I remember, I remember the evangelist E.J. Daniels. Brother Greg said he preached over in Europe one time. 
and he had heard of Romania, Albania somewhere, and he had heard they were having revival over there, and he was scheduled to preach that night with an interpreter. He got to church, Brother Keith. He said church was to start like at 7, and he got there about 6.15. He said he walked in the back door, and it had, he said, it had, he didn't say it, but he had doors like ours, just push doors you push open and walk through. And you know what he heard, Brother Lee? He heard crying and wailing. He said as he walked through the door, Brother Greg, he said he opened the back door and walked through the door in the auditorium, and just as soon as he walked in the door, he had to start dodging people who were laying on the ground begging God. Are you following me? He said they were saying, Oh, God, our country's in a mess. Oh, God, save my son. Save my wayward daughter. And he said he had to dodge people all over the aisle. And they wasn't kneeled. They were on their faces. He said he saw people under pews. He said if he, he saw when he walked in, he had goosebumps. And he said he found an open pew about 6.30. And he said he just sat down there and he listened to them for 30 minutes. He said, I'm talking about crying and wailing and asking God to bless their country. And he said about five minutes to seven, the pastor had been praying over in the corner. The pastor got up and walked to the pulpit and Brother Daniel said, I thought we'd have a couple of songs, and I thought a choir would sing. And he said, I was getting ready. I thought I had a few minutes to get ready. He said, the preacher got up off his face, and he walked up to the pulpit, and he said, Brother Daniels, come preach. He said, people were still on their face praying. Some were sitting in the pew. Brother Daniel said he got up and walked in the pulpit. So, glory to God. Woo! He said, when he walked in the pulpit, he said he felt something get all over him. He said he preached for 27 minutes. He said, some people never got off of their faces. Some of them prayed all the way through to preach. He said, when he got through preaching, he turned to the pastor and said, Pastor, what do I do now? The pastor said, well, we pray some more. When people get ready, they go home. And that was her service. He said, we sat there at 2 o'clock. He said, the pastor sat on the front row. He said, Brother Daniels, I'll wait for everybody to finish praying, and then we'll leave and go get something to eat. He said he came back that next night, and it was the same thing. Revival went on for 102 days. Brother Daniels preached 29 nights in a row. He said, later in the week, people started coming in, sitting down. He said, one man sitting over here about three-fourths of the way through, Brother Ron. He sat down in a pew, and Brother Daniel said, right in front of him was a young woman praying. It was his daughter. And he stood up and said, Preacher, tell my daughter to get up on her face. I'll come to God. I'll come to God. And he walked down the aisle, and the man got saved. We want the touch of God. Tell you, it's going to come. It's going to come on talking to God. It's going to come on going to Him. Brother Howells, in that book I read, he prayed for hours one time. They went a whole year, didn't have a single person saved. Not one person, Brother Greg, a whole year. Drove him crazy. He'd pray and preach. And visitors would come, and he said they'd raise their hand, but nobody would get saved. And he started bothering him more and more. It bothered him more and more. He finally one night went out because of what happened. 
on top of his daddy's grave, a drunkard who had died. And he prayed all night long. He went back to his little church that next morning. And they had eight people saved. And that year they ended up having 300 people saved. I'm talking about a church that wasn't running but 60 people. Look at me, church. You got wayward children? You got a wayward husband, a wayward wife, a wayward mom and dad, a wayward brother and sister? You know the best thing you can do? Get on your face before God. You can't change them. How many of you have tried? How many of you have tried a bunch? Huh? Didn't work out, did it? Because of God. God. What does God, God has to touch their hearts? God does. He wants to touch America. God. You know, at the end of the pandemic in 1918, the Marxists, they ain't just started coming around. They were in full flight then. They had just won World War I with us. They wanted the world to become Marxist. That was their goal. And they had America targeted as their number one goal. Well, you know what? <laughs> you know what a senator said? That was one of them. Somebody asked him, why didn't y'all get what you wanted after the pandemic in 1918, he said, because of men like Billy Sunday and Mordecai Ham and Alton Johnson, he said, God moved all over America and we couldn't do anything. He said, preacher, times are bad. They're not going to get better. I agree with you according to prophecy. According to prophecy, everything we see is lining up, Brother Morris. Even this change thing. All of a sudden, there's a shortage of change. Next is going to be a shortage of, of paper money. And all of a sudden, it's going to be all... Just Look at me, church. Get your head out of saying what the Bible says. We're going to get to a day one day that the government controls everything in our lives. And you won't be able to get nothing like you can now. But you know what I prayed this morning? This morning I've sat in my bed and prayed, Lord, you can give us one last reprieve. You can take a remnant and touch them. There's a remnant going to meet this morning on 6401 Hawk Mountain Road. And you know what you can do, Lord? You can touch that remnant. See, this is a remnant of people who have been through a lot. Lost a lot of people. Used to be a bigger church than we are. This is a remnant who have been through a lot of hard times, personally and as a church. This pastor's been through a lot. A lot of you have been through a lot. But you've stayed in there. You hear me? And I believe God is going to bless that. I want to get back to prayer meetings, church. I want to get back to special prayer meetings, men's prayer meetings and family prayer meetings, noonday prayer meetings, Saturday morning prayer meetings, Friday nights and 9 o'clock prayer meetings. It's our only hope. I don't think we have another hope. I mean, it, I can't do, I can't manipulate, I can't scheme, I can't do things. It's got to be God. It's got to be God. And I read that verse this morning. Be merciful unto me, O Lord. For I cry unto thee daily. And I thought of Brother E.J. Daniel's story. I thought of the first time I ever heard Gil Torres 
Eddie, wasn't you there? I didn't even know who Gil Torres was. He was a Spanish pastor at Lighthouse Baptist Church. We were having a leadership conference, and it was our first time there, I believe. Yeah, it was. And they talked about David Gibbs was preaching, and Paul Chapel was preaching, and and uh, Dr. Cowboy Tom Williams was preaching and, and all that. And then during the day sessions, they had other men pray, preach. And they had on the list there at 1 o'clock, which is the hardest draw. When you've had services in the morning with a bunch of preachers, and you go eat a big old giant meal, and you walk back in the auditorium, that's a hard group to preach to. I've done it before. Everybody really wants you to say something 10 minutes and shut up where they can go to the hotel and sleep. You hear me? It was Gil Torres' turn to preach. I'll never forget this. Never. As long as I live. He walked in the pulpit, Brother Greg. He didn't laugh. He didn't smile. Didn't tell a joke. He read a passage. He started saying a few things about that passage. And all over the building, you felt something. You just felt something. God, God was sitting in that service. And he only preached about 21 minutes. And he gave an invitation to and Brother John, I heard grown men crawl up under pews, crying, begging God. Didn't know till afterwards, Brother Jim. You know what he had came off of when he preached? A 40-day fast. Look at me, church. I don't mean a 40-day Daniel fast where you eat all the vegetables you want, you drink all the juice. He drank nothing but water for 40 days. He said, physically, I was so weak that I almost had to be helped in the pulpit. But when preachers said, I was going to preach to a group of preachers from all over America, that's the only thing I could figure I could do. And they said, it can't be done physically, but Jesus did it. Jesus did it. So I looked back in history, and George Whitfield did it. He said Alexander McLaren did it. He found about eight men that went on what we call true, nothing but water fast for 40 days. And the results afterwards. The results afterwards. I cry unto thee daily. Our country's in a mess. Church, we're in a mess. I mean, it's almost like, it seems like they sit around every night, Brother Shannon, and they try to figure out a way that can be more stupid. That's bad grammar, I know, but you know what I mean. Just pure old more stupid. Or stupider, as they say in South Georgia. They do. I mean, God's Word holds no authority no more. The church is not essential. Bars, I mean, liquor stores are, but the church is not. Protests are fine, but the church can't gather. Huh? Home Depot can have 330 people in it, but the church can't have more than 10. We're in a mess. But guess who built this country? I don't don't listen to them. Is this on recording? Don't listen to them loose brain fruit cakes telling you this country was bad and evil. God raised this country up. God blessed this country. And this country sent missionaries all around the world and millions of people got saved and this country went to war 
with other countries. And this world, say, this country saved France and saved Europe and saved South Korea and saved South Vietnam. This, this country, this country, God has blessed it. And it needs His blessings again. Be merciful unto me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee daily. Just keep me going. I'll read it. Rejoice the soul of thy servant, for unto thee, O Lord, do I lift. How do you do that, by the way, church? How do you lift up your soul to the Lord? In prayer. That's all. How else do you lift your soul up to God? In singing praises. Huh? See, some of you ought to get into this music thing more. Because when you're singing them praises, you're singing to Jesus. You're not singing to the preacher. You're not singing to your neighbor. You're singing to Jesus. And you're singing about Jesus to Jesus. Verse 5. For thou, Lord, art good. <laughs> I love this next phrase. Glory to God. I messed up so many times. <laughs> and ready to forgive. <laughs> oh, Lord, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that what? That what? Call upon thee. We hadn't read but five verses of it, but I get a feeling we've already had the message of it. You got children you're worried about? You got a brother or sister, mom or dad again? I said this a while ago. You got a wife or husband you're worried about? Tell you what let's do right now, Miss Rita. If you will... Can you sing, uh, not sing, but play, you can sing if you want to, but can you play an uh, invitation song, one of the old ones? Uh, what now? That'd be perfect. That'd be perfect. <laughs> Why don't we do some of this right now? Why don't everybody let's stand to your feet and the ones that are willing to, why don't some of them come down? And let's do this. If you physically can, get on your whole face before God. I mean, just come on down and get on your face before God. Or bow down beside a pew or something. If a family wants to come pray together, come on down. Pray for your family. Mom and dad, you got children away from God? You got a brother or sister away from God? You got a good friend away from God? Let's get on our faces before God. It is well with my soul. I didn't feel good this morning. I called Brother Greg, had him to be ready to preach this morning. I didn't really think I was going to preach. But I got back to my office about 9.30, and it's like the Lord just, the Lord said, you know, Psalm 86 you read yesterday. Listen to this song. It is well with my soul. Is anybody here that might say, Preacher, I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven, Preacher. I might need to come get saved, Preacher. Just raise your hand and I'll pray for you. Anyone like that? How many of us say, Preacher, I ain't going to tell you who, but I'm burdened about somebody in my life. Will you pray for my family member? Would you raise your hands up for me? 
Anyone got a family member you want me to pray for? Amen. Amen. Brother John Hurd.